Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rick Hershout. I have the privilege of serving as director of the American Jewish Committee, AJC Los Angeles. We're delighted this evening on behalf of Stephen Wise Temple and AJC to welcome you to a conversation that began in earnest nearly two years ago. Tonight's program, Understanding the Ethnic Studies Model Curriculum, is the first of two webinars this evening's and same time, same channel, next Wednesday evening, March 10th. This evening, we will explore the contours, the background, and the advocacy that has filled our days since this model curriculum was first introduced nearly two years ago. Next week, we will talk about lessons learned and where we go from here, because this is still very early in the journey. We intend for this to be an interactive session this evening, and we encourage you to place your questions in the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen. And we will do our very best to get to your question. We have an exciting and enlightening panel tonight. And the objective of this program is very much to shed more light than heat, because this certainly has been an issue as it has percolated that has generated far too much heat. Many important Jewish organizations have been steady advocates on the ethnic studies issue, including colleagues with us this evening from Jimena and the Jewish Federation of Greater Los Angeles. I can share with you that AJC's position from the outset, like so many others, has been to find common ground with marginalized ethnic communities who support ethnic studies, as well as those who want to ensure that political indoctrination and racial and religious discrimination have no place in the classroom. AJC and others have advocated forcefully for a balanced and inclusive approach, a standard which Governor Newsom articulated in vetoing an earlier measure that would have made the curriculum a mandatory requirement for high school graduation in California. Our collective efforts help to ensure that BDS, the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement, as well as other anti-Semitic offensive material would be removed along with discriminatory material about other ethnic groups. We have also helped to secure, secure the inclusion of lesson plans on anti-Semitism that include the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance established working definition, leveraging important resources, including AJC's recent landmark report on anti-Semitism. Together, we've advanced the importance of other ethnic groups also having lessons in the curriculum, such as the Sikh and Armenian communities who are now represented in the third and final version. And finally, we succeeded in raising public awareness about the extremist ideology of the critical ethnic studies movement, adding balancing guiding language, which is now included in this third vision, version. Why is all of this advocacy so important? To be clear, this California curriculum will be taught to more than 6 million school children, the largest state system in the country. And we know as well that the curriculum will be a model for other states. Three more states already have adopted similar ethnic studies legislation, and 10 more states have pending legislation. So together, our efforts to ensure that the final version of the ethnic studies model curriculum neither includes BDS nor anti-Semitic material, and that it teaches children about contemporary anti-Semitism, and that overall is balanced and inclusive. This will have wide ranging impact on K through 12 education across the country. That's why it matters. And now to our program. It is my pleasure to introduce my partner, 
in this endeavor, Rabbi Ron Stern, director of the WISE Center for Tikkun Olam, who will begin the proceedings and introduce our distinguished panelists. Rabbi Stern. Thank you, Rick. It is my pleasure to partner with the American Jewish Committee. Um, we have a long relationship over many, many years. Our, we share engaged members. Some of us know that we know the same people. Um, the AJC has long been a very, very important um, part of the Jewish community, as has Stephen Wise in Los Angeles. And the fact that we can once again partner in such an important program is uh, deeply significant and deeply rewarding. We're going to go deeply into the ethnic studies curriculum and hopefully, hopefully bring many of you up to speed on some of the issues from folks who are intimately involved. So to give them an opportunity to share their insights and their wisdom, I want to introduce them and begin by opening the conversation up to them. We're gonna also focus on how we got here. Uh, what was the process that led us ultimately to what by many, by many considerations and by many who review it now, is thought to be a uh, fairly good outcome for a long, a long as, as Rick said, a process that was a long time in coming. So let me first introduce Shekhina Larks. Some of you may recognize her from a program we had in the fall where we looked at, uh, at race and Judaism and we explored that over a three part series also with AJC. Shekhina is the program coordinator and diversity trainer at the Hall Lashon up in the Bay Area. She holds a BA in politics from the University of San Francisco. She's a writer, a singer, and, and anytime if you'd like to break out in song Shekhina, we'd love to hear, and a social commentator. Notably, she reflects on the intersection of her identity as a Jewish woman of color. Many of us know Jesse Gabriel, who was first elected to the California State Assembly in June of 2018. He represents the 45th Assembly District. Not too many Jews in your district, I think, Jesse, is that correct? <laughs> it's where most of us live, right? I think I'm um, the only person on my street that isn't a member of your synagogue. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Uh, Jesse serves on five standing committees, including the chair of the Select Committee on Jobs and Innovation in the San Fernando, San, San Fernando Valley, and he's a member of the Select Committee on Women's Reproductive Health. He's the majority whip and was elected by his colleagues as the chair of the California Legislative Jewish Caucus. Jesse has been an active member of the Jewish community for his entire life. Uh, notably, he spent four years living in Israel, and I have to say that um, in the Stern family, he's famous for preceding my own son as president of the Cal Berkeley student body, along with his brother, Oren. And they were important advisors for my son as he stepped up to the, the podium there and also actually fought back a BDS attempt at, at Berkeley. Next is Dan Gold, vice president of Israel education and advocacy at the Jewish Federation of Greater Los Angeles. He's a member of the Jewish, uh, the Los Angeles Federation, uh, and with Dan as their representative, is a member of the Jewish Public Affairs Committee. And Dan, maybe later you'll tell us a little more about JPEC, um, which is part of a broad coalition across the state advocating to ensure that the ethnic studies model curriculum, we'll call it the ESMC going forward, is free of bias against Jews and includes narratives on Jewish Americans. Next, and uh, I'm pleased to welcome uh, our latest and newest addition to our panel, Sarah Levin, who is the executive director of Jemena. Jemena is the acronym for Jews Indigenous to the Middle East and North Africa. She has been with Jemena since 2010, and in that role, she has facilit facilitated its growth through partnerships with national organizations, universities, and speakers bureaus, and uh, lifting up volunteerism. She's also guided Jimenez's educational fundraising and community outreach campaigns, including their day school initiative, their oral history project, and as well as advocacy on behalf of Jews from Arab countries. She has also spent many years in Israel and has served the country, Israel, in various capacities. Um, and she joins us tonight, particularly because Jimenez's involvement in the development of the latest version of the ethnic studies curriculum has been significant, and she'll share some of that as we speak. So just a reminder, I see many of you are doing that already and we praise you for that. Put your questions into the Q&A and we will do our best to um, answer those questions that have not been addressed by the questions that I'll be posing to the speakers. So let's start with assembly member Gabriel and maybe you can talk a little bit about why the ethnic studies curriculum is so important to the state 
Um, and also what will shift from there is exactly what an ethnic studies curriculum seeks to accomplish. And we'll let the other panelists talk about that as well. Yeah, thank you, Rabbi. It's uh, it's good to be with you, and 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 thank you, Rick, as well. And big fan of the work that AJC and has done on this, and and grateful to uh, to Stephen Weiss for putting this together and for your partnership. And it's really good to be with my friend Dan Gold and my friends at the Federation and the folks at Jumena and Shachina. It's nice to to make your acquaintance, and I look forward to working with you in the future. Um, just you know, starting at a very high level. We have an ethnic studies, uh, the, the state is in the process of developing uh, an ethnic studies model curriculum because it's required by law. So in 2016, the state legislature, before I was uh, elected, passed a bill requiring the California Department of Education to develop a model curriculum on ethnic studies. And this was, uh, as, as the name describes exactly that, a model for districts around the state of California that would like to teach ethnic studies. and. This was a huge priority, I will say, for uh, a lot of my colleagues in the legislature, particularly from communities of color for the Black Caucus, the Latino Caucus, uh, the Asian Pacific Islander Caucus, which we call the API Caucus, and, the Na and, and, and we now have a, a Native American colleague in, in the legislature, the first ever to serve. And it would be really hard for me to overstate how, what an important priority this is for them um, and how important it is for them to see themselves and their stories and their history reflected in our education system. And so the, the, a bill was passed and signed into law by Jerry Brown asking the Department of Education to draft a model curriculum. As the legislature, we can sort of outline the broad parameters of, of, of what's required in, in, to be taught in public schools, but we don't, uh, we don't actually draft the curriculum. We, we outsource that to experts. And so the actual drafting of the curriculum is done by the California Department of Education. And the, the, the sentiment behind ethnic studies, and I think if I, I can share the perspective of some of my colleagues in the legislature, is that this is really about fighting bigotry and racism and about promoting diversity and inclusion and about encouraging folks to think critically. I was really struck. We had uh, two weeks ago uh, a resolution on the floor of the state legislature, which was about uh, all the spike we've seen in hate crimes against the Asian American community. Um, which has been really a, an issue of deep concern to all of us. And it, it struck me that two of my colleagues in the legislature, uh, one of them from, from the API community and also a member of, of the Latino caucus talked about ethnic studies and education as part of the antidote to racism. And that this is an important priority to, to tell these stories, to uplift communities of color, to, to center some of our history around them, to make sure that people understand the, the, the history and to think critically about some of the more challenging periods of history is a really, really important initiative. And I, I, I shared um, on another one of these, uh, these webinars that I had the pleasure of doing about my colleague, James Ramos, who is the first, as I mentioned, the first uh, Native American, the first indigenous California person to serve in the legislature. And he has a great affinity for, for, for the Jewish community. He's always seeking me out to talk to me about our shared uh, history of genocide and how we might work together on Holocaust education and genocide education feels a real a sense of connection to the Jewish community. And for him, it's so important that there's an accurate history and an accurate recounting of how our Native American community was treated in the state of California. You know, I, you know, I went to public schools in, 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 in Southern California and you, you know, you read Island of the Blue Dolphin and you, you built your mission, but there wasn't a real understanding of, of what in a lot of cases was the um, you know, the state sponsored genocide against the, the, the Native American community. And so bringing some of that history back into the classroom, having people think critically about these issues is an extraordinarily important priority um, for a lot of folks in, in the legislature. And that was, I think, the impetus for, for the legislature passing this bill in 2016 to mandate the creation of the model curriculum. And, and as you mentioned, Rabbi, part of the reason that this is so important is because there are efforts now to make it a high school graduation requirement. And we know that the model curriculum will very likely be adopted by school districts across the state because it's very easy for them. They will be able to use those materials in the model curriculum to rely on them. It's, it's quite likely the textbooks would be drafted based on what's in the model curriculum. And so one of the reasons that our Jewish caucus in, in, you know, in partnership with all of these community organizations has been so deeply engaged over the past almost two years is it's really important that we get that model curriculum right. It will be used here in the state of California, and I think will certainly become something that other states will look to uh, as they as they start to think about ethnic studies as well. Shahina, could you talk <laughs> about the, the content in terms of why certain things are included, why things some things are left on the table, off the table, I should say, as far as the curriculum? Do you have a sense of that? 
Um, I could not speak to that actually. I'm okay. not intimately involved with the drafting of the curriculum. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, Sarah, so I can. You would, sorry, Rabbi, I can add just a, <clears throat> to answer a little bit. This is this is you know, one of the things I'll say um, to your initial question in, in the intro. And first of all, just because it's my first time speaking, I want to thank you, Rabbi, everybody at Stephen Wise, and of course, Rich and AJC and Assemblymember Gabriel and my other fellow panelists for having me and, and for being part of this. Um, you know, as you mentioned, the LA Federation is, is a leading member of JPAC, the Jewish Public Affairs Committee of California. And of course, AJC is also a member. <clears throat> and collectively, the 25 plus members throughout the state work together to, as best we can, partner with the Jewish Caucus in Sacramento to promote legislation uh, that's of a priority to the Jewish community. Uh, and because this was a legislative issue initially, and it technically still is, that's why JPAC got so involved. And in, in the process, what we learned, you know, is ethnic studies, you know, I like to say, I like to say it might be named improperly because it's not necessarily a class on everybody's ethnicity. This is really something that began from what we've learned, you know, in the 60s and the 70s, you know, up in places like San Francisco State at the university level, where, where folks as Jesse said, people of color really did not feel that their narratives were being taught from their perspective. Uh, and so that's where this all started. And it's been a movement for decades that's now finally reaching to the point that the curriculum is being created at all levels. Um, but that's complicated because then what does it mean to teach the narrative of different people? And, and things have changed since the 60s. And so I think ultimately where a lot of the complications have been in all of our work to, to make sure that this model curriculum is best has been to figure out how do you include the right narratives and say the right thing that's fair to everybody? And do you expand beyond the, the four main groups that we've been outlining? You know, and how do you expand beyond that? And so that's really been some of these issues we've been tackling. Yeah, I think Dan, you actually raise a very important question, which is um, we, the four groups, Native American, Pacific Islanders, Latinos and Black Americans, um, are generally included in the field of ethnic studies. And one of the things the Jewish community has lobbied for heavily is to include Jews in ethnic studies. So Sarah and Shekhinah, I'd like, actually like to turn to you both and ask you first and foremost, why is it important for Jews in general to be included? And then also as multi-ethnic and multi-racial Jews, um, what would you say is the case for your identities to be represented in the curriculum. The two, the two pieces that are included in the current version of the curriculum, the two examples or model curricula um, actually focus on Jews of multi-ethnic identity. So maybe we could talk a little bit about that. So um, Sarah, would you like to start or Shekhinah, either way is fine with me. Go ahead, jump in Shekhinah, you read off um, first, Bye. So first of all, I think it's extremely important to point out that even within the first draft of the ethnic studies model curriculum, anti-Semitism was listed as a form of bigotry. So right off the bat, we were included um, by the recognition that anti-Semitism is a pervasive form of bigotry in the United States. So as you mentioned, Jemena represents the 1 million Jewish refugees from the Middle East and their Mizrahi and Sephardic descendants, including Iranian Jewish Americans who comprise one of the largest Middle Eastern diaspora communities in the world. Um, here in California, we estimate that there's probably like 200,000 Mizrahi and Sephardic Jews, including Israelis, Iranians, um, Jews from North Africa and the Middle East. So within the discipline of ethnic studies, Arab American studies is frequently like under the ba banner of Asian American studies. More generally, Asian American studies, including in the latest draft of the model curriculum, focuses on the experiences of Southwest Asians. So people who come from Southwest Asia, which is the Middle East. So for all intents and purposes, Mizrahi and Sephardic Jewish communities are from Southwest Asia. And even the third draft of the curriculum recognizes this, that Jewish people are part of, South, of this, you know, diaspora community in the United States. This is why we've been asking for our inclusion to be under the umbrella of the Asian American Studies section of the Ethnic Studies Model Curriculum. We also recognize that this is a high school curriculum. This isn't a cut. This is not part of a university curriculum. So we believe we, we feel it's incredibly important that we hold the California Department of Education 
up to, to, to ensure that they follow the statutory guidelines that they created when they wrote the curriculum, which was for this model curriculum to be inclusive, for it to be balanced, and for it to be reflective of different experiences of ethnic groups here in California. We understood right away that it would be unfair of them and perhaps even discriminatory of them to include certain groups from Southwest Asia and for them to ignore and exclude other groups who are asking for inclusion. So right off the bat, we've been asking for inclusion in the Southwest as an Asian community, Southwestern Asian community. So With full respect for the four foundational groups. I just wanna put that out there. From the get-go, our coalition of organizations said that we support ethnic studies. We support, the, we support AB 2016 and that we believe in ethnic studies and the benefits for different communities in California. So you're not seeking a zero sum end. You're seeking the pie is large enough to share with. Absolutely, right, absolutely. Right. Especially for high school. This is not, you know, a college ethnic studies department. This is high school. So Sheena, as, as, a, as a Jew of color, what does this ethnic studies program ultimately mean to you? Um, growing up, I, you know, growing up black in America's schools, like black history is always reserved for February. and it's taught as supplementary. And I noticed that that was something that is also the same with how we teach about Jewish identity. We teach about Jewish identity only in the context of the Holocaust. We teach about black identity only in the context of the civil rights movement and slavery. And these peoples are so much more rich than that. And we don't take the opportunities to examine their innovation their, um, their communal traditions, their spirituality, and the diversity that exists within these groups. What ends up happening in, the, in, this, in these curriculums is that we monolith them. We make them into one large group based off a, a snapshot of the population. And this is what has happened with most education, most education around Jews, even in Jewish spaces is that we're not educating even, we're not even educating in day schools, our kids on different minhagim um, and Jewish communities throughout the world. So, you know, working with Bacola Shon, Bacola Shon in 2000 did a study that found that about 20% of America's Jews are Asian, African-American, Latino, and, and Latino and mixed race. Given that, um, given that, those narratives should be included and should be included based on the four primary categories that were presented. To monolith Black identity under the realm of Christianity, under the realm of civil rights, and to not talk about Black, the not talk about the Great Migration and talk about things and talk about other things that Black Americans have contributed, that Black Muslims have contributed, that Black Jews have contributed to California does a disservice to our children in our classrooms, especially to those who we're trying to, especially for a curriculum that's trying to make sure that we're including everybody. Um, when we are asking our kids to uh, only look at one part of their identity and leave their religious identity at the door, leave half of their ethnic identity at the door, like what are we, like how are we fully educating them holistically? How are we actually incorporating the stated goal of intersectionality if we're asking kids to leave half of their identity at the door? So ultimately it sounds like you're saying that even a Jewish day school could benefit from a robust ethnic studies curriculum to recognize the, the richness and variety of the Jewish community uh, because it's far more diverse than many of us have been led to believe growing up or maybe they will even represent in our classrooms. Interesting. So a shift a little bit to the first version of the curriculum, which um, by all accounts was, was destructively anti-Semitic. Um, in fact, only recently there was an article in Tablet Magazine that was passed around um, and appeared in many of our inboxes. And it turns out that it was actually more reflective of the original version that was subsequently vetoed by the governor. And Sarah, you even wrote that um, what the Tablet Magazine article actually failed to address was the truth about the current version, which is that all of the activists and of the Jewish communities have turned what has been a hurtful document into a model for how to include content about Jews in the contemporary classroom. And that's actually a quote from the article that you wrote. So let's talk about the process. 
uh, that got us to where we are. And we can talk about it from a couple of different places. Um, first, the, of course, the legislature. Um, Jesse, and you can comment on that. And Dan, you can talk about JPAC's involvement. And Trina, I believe that, if I'm not mistaken, you appeared before a panel and actually spoke to the curriculum. Maybe you can share a little bit about that if you can. And Sarah, of course, Jimena's involvement in that would be interesting. So why don't we just go around as I see you on my screen and we'll go back to Jesse and you can talk about the legislature a little bit, if you would. Yeah, thanks, Rabbi. So, you know, this is something that a little bit um, came out of left field for us. The, the, the notion of, of ethnic studies, I think prior to the release of this first draft was not something that was particularly controversial in the legislature or in the Jewish community. ADL was, has, has been a proponent of ethnic studies for some time and understanding that the benefits to fighting hate of, of people learning about folks from diverse backgrounds and, and having a better sense of understanding and, and efforts to promote diversity and inclusion are, are healthy in a, in a pluralistic multi-ethnic democracy like California. What really happened is that this first draft came out and, and it just caught everybody off guard and it was extraordinarily problematic as, 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 as you described, right? I mean, I, as, as um, you know, an identified Jew in the state of California, somebody who lived in Israel, I was like, I don't know that I could send my kids to, to public school in the state of California if this is the draft. I mean, this is not just problematic stuff about the BDS movement. This is stuff that is deeply, you know, we, in, in a letter we wrote that, that the tablet article uh, uh, quotes, you know, this is deeply, there was a deep anti-Jewish bias built into this. Now, what had happened is, as, as we sort of later reconstructed it, is that the Department of Education was required to prepare this model curriculum. And they went out and, and you know, sort of subcontracted with a group of three folks to write it. And it turned out that those three folks, some of them had deeply problematic views. And, and I think views that are really far outside the mainstream and that were frankly offensive and bigoted. And so as soon as this, this initial draft came out, there was a huge uproar. Our Jewish caucus uh, wrote a very strongly worded letter objecting to it, pointing out how flawed and biased and discriminatory it was. Um, by the way, we were not the only community or group to object to this. Um, and, and you know, you had the, the LA Times editorial board, which I think most people would consider a left-leaning editorial board, which criticized the curriculum broadly. You had other communities, Sikhs, Armenians, Koreans, other folks who, who felt excluded from the curriculum and wanted to see themselves at the table. And so there was a really big uproar. And because of that, they actually had to push pause on the development of the curriculum and, and push it back by a year. And part of this happened, I think, as, as, as much as I, we can reconstruct this, because it was happening sort of in between the transition from the Brown administration to the Newsom administration. There was also a new superintendent of public instruction. And so some of this sort of slid under the radar. But they basically had to go back uh, because there was such an uproar and start the process of really redrafting parts of this. And that's where the Jewish community got really deeply engaged and a lot of the folks sitting here on this panel, organizations, AJC, ADL, federations, JCRCs, up and down the state, uh, Stand With Us, IAC, a bunch of organizations got really involved and, and were very much at the table providing feedback as they went through multiple rounds of, of you know, drafting and redrafting the curriculum. And, and I think that that was a very important process. The Jewish community was, you know, unfortunate to me, some of what was in the tablet article, because it talked about this first draft. It didn't really reflect all of the effort that was put into it. I, I saw something, I think after one of the drafts that the Jewish community had submitted like 30,000 comments that, that members of the California Jewish community objecting to portions of this. I think our community may have submitted more comments and feedback to the folks drafting this um, than, than you know, any other community. And, 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 and they listened to us. You know, the, one of the first things that happened is that the governor, Governor Newsom came out and apologized. And he said, this curriculum is offensive and I'm gonna publicly apologize to the Jewish community, even though it's not my fault and I didn't have anything to do with it. And I'm gonna promise you that this curriculum is never gonna see the light of day. And we had as a Jewish caucus, multiple you know, meetings with the governor, folks high up in his administration. We had a number of meetings with our superintendent of public instruction. He gave us his firm commitment um, that there would be nothing in this draft at the end of it when it comes out in the curriculum that would be either anti-Semitic or anti-Israel, or they could be perceived as anti-Semitic and anti-Israel. So we were able to, you know, work work with them to get these firm commitments, um, and 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 to try to improve the curriculum. Now I will say it, this is this is extremely complicated and nuanced stuff. And I'm not an expert in curriculum. I'm not an educator by trade. But you know, my guess is Rabbi Stern. I could I, I, I could get you, and I could go over to VBS where I'm a member and get Rabbi Farkas. Uh, and I could get some of, you know, I could get, get some scholars from AJU and you could all sit around at a Shabbat dinner table at my house and you would have slight differences of opinion about this and about the best way to do this. This is deeply nuanced and complicated stuff. And, and I will say there was not a unanimity of opinion in the Jewish community when this first came out. I spent hours on the phone with friends at, 
from, from a whole plethora of Jewish community organizations. You know, and I'd have a call with, with, with Sarah, she'd be, she'd be blowing me up and, you know, my text messages and we talked for a little bit and I'd have a call with her and two, and, you know, she, she'd say, we got to do A and, you know, two hours later, I'd have a call with a prominent rabbi or Jewish community activist in the, in the Bay Area and they'd say, no, 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 we got to do B. Now, what is nice about what happened is that over time, the, the, the Jewish community really sort of coalesced into what it was looking for. Um, and I think it was an approach that sort of what we tried to follow as, as a Jewish caucus, our approach here was sort of threefold. One was get the bad stuff out, right? There, there were firm red lines. We cannot have a curriculum that teaches anti-Semitic stereotypes in our public schools. That is absolutely unacceptable. We cannot have a curriculum that is going to, you know, teach people stuff about the Middle East and about Israel that is not accurate, that is going to promote hate against Israelis or Jews. And so we had to draw really firm red lines. And so that was that was priority number one. And we were able to, you know, secure those commitments from the governor and from the state superintendent of public instruction pretty early on. Great. Great. Number two was to get the Jewish community in, right? And, and this was part of a broader strategy from a lot of communities that looked at the curriculum and said, this does not reflect the full diversity of California. This does not reflect the mosaic of, of what makes California special. And that was part of the governor's veto message when he, he, he vetoed the bill to make it a high school graduation requirement. He said, this needs to be broadly inclusive. And so step number two was, how do we get the Jewish community and our story to be reflected and taught in an accurate and positive way in this curriculum? And that's where folks like Sarah and Jimena came in and other, uh, you know, other educators and community organizations. And now we have, as you know, not, not one, but two lessons about the American Jewish community that are included in the curriculum. And step number three, which was very important to us, we did this, is to do it in a way that enhanced rather than diminished our relationships with other ethnic and religious communities for whom this is an important priority. And again, I cannot overstate how important this issue is to our, my colleagues in the, in the Black Caucus, in the Latino Caucus, in the API Caucus. And for them, you know, they're looking at this, this huge curriculum that's got a lot in it. They, you know, the, again, the initial draft, it was problematic, but the parts about our community were very, you know, very limited, some, some problematic references. And it was actually hard for them to understand what, like, why would, why would you be opposed to ethnic studies? For them, ethnic studies is a continuation of, of the civil rights movement, of, of social justice. And so we had to do some education with them to say, these are the things that make this problematic from our community's perspective. Again, we are allies and partners of yours in lifting up the stories of your community and making sure that they are reflected accurately in the history books. Um, and, but, but at the same time, we have concerns from our community. And so we wanted to do this in a way, it, it, it created some tension. Um, and there were some tough conversations, but to sit with people and have them understand from our community's perspective why certain things were were, were just fundamental. I want to just turn it to Sarah for a second, if you don't mind, Sarah, and just basically um, ask you to frame the argument of why should Jews be included in the curriculum at all? Why not Italians? You know, I spoke about this a little bit. Italians or Greeks or or other minorities. Why why would you advocate as as a Jewish organization to include Jews in the curriculum? Sure. Well, like I said in the beginning, anti-Semitism is recognized as a form of bigotry within an ethnic studies frame. Right now, in the state of California, um, violent anti-Semitic acts targeting Jews, we're the second most target, or we're the number one most targeted group for religious-based hate crimes. Com Crimes targeting Jews comprise close to 70% of all hate crimes targeting religious group in the state of California. So I think anti-Semitism alone being recognized as a form of bigotry sh should yield itself okay. to the inclusion of a lesson on anti-Semitism in my opinion. And this is the, this is the position that Jimena has taken from the very beginning. Um, we can't talk about white supremacy. We can't talk about struggles of ethnic minority groups without talking about anti-Semitism. And yet the, the, the topics, as Jews are discussed in the curriculum, don't just address anti-Semitism, they, they, they address Jewish ethnicity and, and the complexity of Jewish ethnicity. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. It, so it, it actually presents a broader picture of the Jewish community. Yeah, so, I know, mean, yeah, there's two lessons that both, lessons. yeah, yeah. yeah. So Dan, would you talk about JPAC a little bit, just what it is and how you got involved? Uh, yeah, JPAC got involved. Absolutely. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about what JPAC did, and especially relating to the questions you've asked. So JPAC, as I mentioned, is a is a member organization of 
Jewish organizations throughout the state, federations, the AJC chapters, ADL, folks like that, that come together to, to work with legislators on the best interests of the Jewish community on, on state issues. And so we've been involved on this particular legislative issue quite a bit. And I wanna go back to the idea of this being a legislative issue, because when you, when you ask Jesse, you know, to talk a little bit about the process, let's say, you know, this is actually, and this is something that I think is actually worth repeating quite often whenever we talk about this. And we, were, we all were talking about this prior to, to going alive here today is that this is a process that happens when any new uh, subject is introduced into the California State uh, Board of Education, whatever, whatever, whether it's a math course or a science course, or in this case, a social studies course, this is the process where a piece of legislation says we want to teach this in every school, the, the Department of Education goes to their IQC, their, in, uh, their Instructional Quality Commission, to then, as Jesse said, outsource it to, to educators to write a curriculum. And then what happens after that is there are very long periods of writing and public comment. And that cannot be changed, no matter the subject, no matter how problematic any of the versions are. And so JPEC has been involved because we've been monitoring every version from the beginning, as Jesse mentioned, all the way up until this latest fourth and, and probably final version of the curriculum. And I think it's important also to say that, you know, you know Rabbi Stern, your question about why, why is it important for Jews to be included? And I think what Sarah and Shekhina said is, is, pro is for sure the foundational answer, right? This this idea that Jews are some of those uh, ethnic groups that are already being talked about and, and weren't at all referenced in any of the early drafts. So it needs to be said that folks from different uh, backgrounds, people of color can be Jewish and what that means, that certainly should be a piece of it. Um, but also when that first draft came out, there were so many red flags in it about being number one, anti-Jewish and number two, including narratives beyond those main four groups that the Jewish community said, well, look, we're okay if it's gonna be these four groups, but if it's going to go beyond it, you know, there really should be a fair treatment and a fair representation of Jewish American narratives. And I just want to correct something that was said earlier, because I think it's important for this um, particular conversation, that original draft curriculum, the first one, listed forms of bias. Anti-Semitism was actually not on that list. We worked to add it to that list. And by not having it on that list, in addition to all the other problems, the, there was the red alarm in the Jewish community. And we had to say, okay, this is basically anti-Jewish. So JPAC, working with the caucus, working with partner organizations, of course, working with individual activists to try to just rally our voices and let the Department of Education know we want this improved. And I think it's important for our audience today and really everybody to understand that that first draft went through, as Assemblymember Gabriel said, this rigorous public comment period where the Jewish community spoke loud and spoke often and our voice was heard. Then there was a second draft, again, was improved. There was some, there still was some ambiguity about how many narratives would or wouldn't be involved, uh, included. And that's why the Jewish community kept our voices loud and proud about, okay, we're, we're glad that it's no longer a document on, uh, you know, an anti-Semitic document, but we still need some representation. So there was another period of public review. And then a third draft came out and there was an even third public review. And all these processes are, as, Je as Assembly Member Gabriel said, it's mandated by law. And so we did have the governor came out and said, right away, this is unacceptable, we'll fix it. We had the head of the State Board of Education who ultimately will put the stamp on the final model curriculum, Linda Darling Hammond, she came out immediately and said, this is not acceptable, we will fix it. But there was no way to jump the process. We still had to go through the process. And JPAC's role has been to be involved at every step of the way of that process with our community members, with our amazing legislators and ensure that we can get this model curriculum to be representative as best we can. And I'll just say this from my perspective, as much as makes sense, given the representation of other groups and maybe other of the non four main groups to make sure that there's a fair representation of the Jewish American narrative, the diversity of Jewish Americans. And of course, that there's no way that a teacher could take this um, and teach about BDS or any other bad thing. And one, one final point that I just want to make is that I mentioned that this started in the 60s and the 70s kind of like as an activist thing. And one of the reasons that it's so complex now is that things have changed, right? right? And so some people believe it should only include a certain certain amount of narrative. Some people it should include more. And we at the Jewish, in the Jewish community, some of us, I think I'd say most of us don't know if we feel comfortable because it's not our area of expertise to say, this is how the ethnic studies curriculum should be structured. 
We're kind of waiting to be told what it's going to look like, and we're reacting to ensure that it's in the best interest of the Jewish community. Right, and thanks. that's the role that JPEC has taken. Shina, what, thanks, thanks, Dan. Shina, one of the um, my encounter with Bechol Hashon actually began back in uh, July or August uh, when I first spoke to Diane Tobin, and I have to say that um, really it's opened my eyes in ways that I was unaware up until. Um, I came to meet you and the folks that you work with and, and browse your website. Um, you bring a, the organization brings a unique perspective to the conversation. So as Bahal Ashon inserted itself into the debate about the ethnic studies curriculum, what would you say the objective of your organization was? What did you seek to accomplish as a, a, a unique, a, an organization that occupies a unique space in that really multi-ethnic um, place in the Jewish community as, as a, as a really is a forerunner in that. We seek to complicate narratives and, you know, like we want to have more complete stories. And part of making a story complete is examining every aspect of the narrative, right? We're gonna be talking about Jews and we wanna fully understand what the American Jewish community looks like, or even more smallly, like what the California Jewish community looks like. I mean, like, I think it's important to note that like 36% of California, of Bay Area families at least, are living in, in, in a household with another person of color. And that that, that, that is significant. And that, um, but the rate of intermarriage in our community, we are having more and more families of color in our, in our spaces. Not only that, but we, like those, those people are in our community too. The, the parent the parent of the Jewish, that's raising the non-Jewish parent of a Jewish child is just as much part of the Jewish community as any other Jew. And we, those stories are important in our community. And the stories of, and the stories of Jews of color are important in our community and they're important to understanding the narrative of Jewish peoplehood. Without understanding all of those stories, you have a limited, you have a limited understanding of what Jewish peoplehood looks like in California and more broadly in the, in the United States. Um, part of the reason that we decided to go um, and testify at the first, at the first hearing in Sacramento um, was because we felt it was so, we felt that it was necessary to have Jews, Jews at least included, um, if this was going to be the curriculum that was going to go forward, that Jews at least be included in the four main categories of, of ethnic identity that the, that the curriculum sought to include to begin with, primarily because Jews exist in those categories. So to tell, to tell a story about the Latinx Jewish community or the Latinx American community without telling the story that 25% of Latinx people have Jewish heritage, to tell the story of indigenous people in the United States without telling the story of any stories of indigenous Jews. We have now um, in Washington, on the Washington Supreme Court, a indigenous Jewish uh, justice that's incredible, you know? There are so many diverse narratives um, in, in the Jewish community. And when we talk about what, how we represent the kids in our classroom, it's really important that we are, we are embracing the possibility of all of those narratives. I'm gonna turn now to some questions that have come to us uh, from those who are uh, watching. And folks, don't worry, we can see your questions. Some of you are concerned that uh, you can only see your own questions, but we can see all of them. So one of the questions that actually um, um, I have in my notes and, and can also has come from the, uh, the, the watchers here on Zoom is the challenge of many school districts in our vast state. Now I happen to know that LAUSD, and you'll hear from Nick Melvoin next Wednesday, who's uh, here as representative of the uh, LAUSD Council, um, has their own ethnic studies curriculum and Los Angeles has a large Jewish population not too difficult to get Jewish topics into that ethnic studies program. What if we find ourselves in Northern California somewhere and the ethnic studies curriculum is handed out to the teachers there? What's, is there any guarantee that they'll be teaching about Jews in Humboldt County, say, or anyone of those places? I'm, I, Jesse, maybe it's something you can comment on or I'm not sure who actually can do that, but. 
Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take a swing at it. So again, um, part of the reason it's really important to, uh, and, and why the community was so engaged in trying to shape the model curriculum is because the odds are really high that Humboldt County is going to use the model. Right? That that's what the school district there is going to use. I mean, that's just, uh, for, for all practical purposes, for cost and, and everything else that's likely to be used. Um, now, one of the things I think we all need to be sort of aware of that maybe I'd add is there are different versions of ethnic studies that people are pushing. Right? There is a very hard ideological version that is being pushed by a small group of folks that were intimately involved in writing the first one. And that is a very problematic version, I think, from our community's perspective, but I also think from the perspective of most Californians. I, I don't think people want an ethnic studies curriculum that's promoting bigotry or discrimination or racism being taught in our classrooms. And so we have, as a community, have had to push back very hard against that. There are other versions of this curriculum that are much more inclusive that are much more balanced, that encourage critical thinking, that ask people to think about uh, a, a lot of these issues, which are so important in a, in a pluralistic, multi-ethnic democracy, but do so in a way that can really, you know, represent the, as I've said, you know, the diversity, the broad diversity of the state. And so part of what this effort has really been about is to elevate this, that version of ethnic studies and to make sure that is what is reflected in the model curriculum. So, um, you know, one thing we're going to, but we're going to have to be aware about this, of, of this, those, those folks who um, were involved in the original version, interestingly, you, 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 I think you may know this, Rabbi, have disassociated themselves with the curriculum. Now. The curriculum has moved so far from that original draft that they proposed that they have said, take our names on this, you know, take our names on this. We want nothing to do with this. This isn't the, the hardcore anti-Semitic version that we would have preferred. So to me, that's a really important validator of, of, of how far this curriculum has moved. Now, those folks are going to go school district by school district, and they're already starting, and they're going to go to, you know, Oakland Unified and SF Unified and say, teach, teach the real version of ethnic studies, teach this original version. In our community, as we've, as we've done on, on other issues, we're going to have to mobilize, and we're going to have to engage, and we're going to have to educate school board members there about what's really going on. Because for a lot of people, post-George Floyd, post Breonna Taylor, you know, in, in, in 2021, you know, if you come to a school board member and you say you should teach ethnic studies, you should teach racial justice, that's a, that's a no brainer for a lot of these folks, right? That is an important thing for us to do at this moment around. And so we need to be there at the table, educating these folks um, about, look, we, we support the, the broader goals of, of ethnic studies of racial justice, but we need to make sure that if we have a curriculum that is not at the same time promoting discrimination, promoting bigotry, singling out the Jewish community in an unfair way, um, and, and, and I think we can do that. I, I think, you know, it's, it, this is not over, but we've made enormous progress at, at the state level. We've moved what was originally a, you know, objectively bigoted curriculum into a much, much better place. Right. And we're going to have to go through that exercise with some local school boards as well. So there's still work to learn. And I think there's a, thank you. Sarah, there's a question about um, a Jewish narrative that's included in the curriculum. Um, are you able to share the content of, of that particular I know there are two, there are two model curriculum. Yeah. yeah, so I'm happy to just talk a little bit about the process that we took as well, because I think it's really important. Um, so in the very beginning of this, when the first draft was released, Jemena organized with our 12 Sephardic partner organizations throughout the state of California to respond to the problematic first draft. We understood very early on that as a Southwestern Asian or a Middle Eastern community, we had every right to ask for inclusion and to respond to the model curriculum. Um, we also worked with a group called Advocates for Inclusive Middle Eastern Education, which, was a co which is a coalition of diverse minority groups from the Middle East and North, or the, the Middle East, including Kurds, Assyrians, Coptic Christians, Baha'is, all different groups from the Middle East who together comprise 60% of California's Middle Eastern community, but none of us saw ourselves reflected in the first draft of the ethnic studies model curriculum. Together we asked for balance and inclusion. Um, we then worked with scholars and curriculum writers to draft a lesson that focused on Mizrahi and Sephardic Jews. We realized very, very early on that we had a unique opportunity and a huge responsibility for all Jews in the state. 
So Ashkenazi Jews, Sephardic Jews, Jews of color, Jews of all backgrounds. We felt we had a responsibility to create a lesson plan that all Jews could see themselves reflected in. That's why Jimena chose to produce a curriculum that's focused on anti-Semitism rather than the ethnic experiences or the experiences of Mizrahi Jews as an ethnic minority, an ethnic Middle Eastern minority in the United States. So our lesson is called anti-Semitism in Middle Eastern Jewish Americans. We're telling stories of anti-Semitism as experienced by Middle Eastern Jewish Americans with the hope that all Jews can see themselves reflected in this lesson. Beautiful. So another question that comes to us is the one that I think in so many, in so many ways is the classic Jewish fear. We have exercised our muscle, we've exerted our influence, we've uh, utilized our connections, and we've uh, really achieved a goal that from the perspective of the Jewish community uh, was ultimately the one we wanted to achieve. Is there a risk of us being accused of having taken over the conversation? Um, is there a backlash that could come about Jewish, Jewish power and anti-Semitism? Dan, are you, are you worried about that or how do we deal with that, if that's indeed yeah. a worry? Yeah, I mean, look, it's it's a great question and a great concern. And I think anytime you're in the world, the, the field of community engagement, which my work at the Federation falls in the area of community engagement, you, there's a balance and you're fighting and you're pushing for the interests that are beneficial and important to the Jewish community. But at the same time, you're trying to forge strong relationships, if not partnerships with other communities. And there's often tension and sometimes that's, that's difficult. Um, you know, my, my role when, when the skies are open and there's no pandemic is I lead folks like Jesse's colleagues to on, on, on uh, legislative trips to Israel. And that's one way that we can create these relationships. So when there is an issue that we're working on so in depthly and maybe being so forceful, we, we're, we are kind of looking both sides. And Assembly Member Gabriel mentioned how, how much they're focusing on working with those other caucuses. Um, and I think that, that you know, this, it's, I think it's okay to say that in this situation, we, we, we had to do a little bit of putting our blinders on to get to that end result. But I will respond to that question by saying, I don't think we've actually exercised the full extent of our abilities. And I think that a lot of the questions I'm getting now, and I'm sure all of my fellow panelists and other folks out there are saying, well, what can we do now? If this third and final draft is you know, good and, and quote unquote acceptable, what's next? And I think Assembly Member Gabriel outlined it, which is get more involved in your local level. You know, get involved with a school board member that you think is really positive. Run your, run your go get motivated and put yourself on the ballot for school board, get to know principals, because this is not just an issue that's gonna come up and go away. It's not just ethnic studies. And you know, the one other thing I do think it's important to say is this isn't only mandated by legislation that we're gonna see this. There's already being taught in schools. There are schools out there, whether their district created the curriculum or their district gave them the thumbs up or not, where a principal or a social studies teacher said, I wanna teach ethnic studies and it's being taught. Uh, history classes are being taught, right? That talk about Israel and the Jewish community. You know, the lesson plan on Holocaust, the Holocaust is part of the core curriculum. We should know and we should be involved and folks like ADL and others are involved, but it's really this holistic approach that I think the Jewish community can do and continue to improve our involvement at lo in local education and local process. And I think if that's what people take away from this, I think the Jewish community will do itself a big favor in doing that while also keeping in mind the priority of, of, bo of the bonds that we need. Because if you do it now, if, if somebody gets involved in their local school board now, and it's not a reaction to some problematic piece of content, then they can do it in partnership with other groups. They can do it in you know, relationship with, with other ethnicities, other religious groups or whatever it may be. And so I do think it's, it is a concern. And I think the, the remedy to that is to be proactive starting now and being involved with positivity uh, and with our arms wide open, as Assembly Member Gabriel said at the beginning. Can I, can I jump in on that, Rabbi? Is that okay? Do you mind? I just, I, I, I want to add one thing. I, I understand the spirit of the question, but I, I really don't think that we need to be shy or, or, or apologize for participating in the democratic process. And I will say as an elected official who sits in Sacramento, I watch every other community and interest groups up and down the state from farmers to realtors, to the Latino caucus, to the black caucus, who are very deeply involved in trying to advocate for their community's priorities. The Latino caucus is a quarter of the legislature and they, without any hesitation, get in there and fight really hard for their community. And I think those of us who are watching them do it really respect them for doing it because that's their mission. And I, I don't think we have anything to apologize for as Jews to be to, to stand up for ourselves in a democratic way if we do it with integrity and honesty 
and 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 with with the best of intentions and the way that we our community has done it, that's how democracy works. And I think we need to be proud of who we are. I think we were working really hard to right a wrong here to prevent bigotry and discrimination. I mean, it's you know crazy to me that in the year 2021 in the state of California we have to fight that, but that's that's the reality of being Jewish in in the modern world. I don't think we should have to apologize for that. I think that's something that we should be we should be really proud of. And again, we we are trying to do it in a thoughtful, in a sensitive, in a menschy way. To do it in a way that builds relationships and enhances relationships. But I don't, I don't think we need to apologize for 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 you know seeking out our elected officials and decision makers and saying we want a curriculum that works for everybody, that works for all of California's children, including Jews. And the piece you added, I think, is important about building relationships in the process. So, Shina, um, on some level, you get it from both sides, right? You experience racism as a Black American, and you experience anti-Semitism as a Jewish American. Um, are, do you have any concerns about how this exercise of power might impact both Blacks in this country, in this state, and Jews, or is you you kind of in a, in a party with Jesse and Dan? I mean, you know, like we all should be able to exercise our rights in the democratic process and any critique of a community for doing so is is ridiculous like we have we have the exact same rights of every as everyone else in the process and everybody has a right to speak up for themselves and have their voices heard and if other communities are not advocating i mean like if if we're not going to i mean like if you're not going to Close mouths don't get fed. So I can't, we can't be upset with, you You can't be upset with the Jewish community because we made sure our voices were heard and we came out in mass for something that was harmful to our community. I'm sure every community when something is harmful to their community comes out in mass. When things are harmful to the black community, we come out in mass and we solve the problem. So, you know, this isn't any, this isn't any different. And um, I applaud every community that comes out and um, handles their business, so to speak. So a question to thank you, the question to kind of wrap things up. Um, the Atlantic in this last month's edition uh, introduced what they're calling the Inheritance Project. And Jeffrey Goldberg, who is the editor of the Atlantic said the following about black Americans. Too much knowledge has been lost. Too many stories distorted. Too many people forgotten. We mourn for all we do not know Yet the vision and resilience of Black America are shaping this nation. Our future demands that we unbury the past. So the question I'd like to ask the four of you, and just to answer briefly, if you can, um, I know it's a big question, is what's the Jewish case for including the key four ethnic identities in the curriculum? What's the Jewish case for teaching about Black ethnicity? The Black, what's the Jewish case for teaching about Latinx? What's the Jewish case for Asian and Pacific Islanders? For native, why does it matter to Jews that those four ethnicities are represented in the curriculum? So why don't we start with you, Shekhin, and we'll go back around the other way. Kol Aravim Zebaze, all of Israel is responsible for each other. If there's only one black Jew, his narrative deserves to be told, you know? This is about our community. And I think that a lot of times we look at ethnic studies or we look at racial justice as a Jewish community as something that's happening outside the community that because of tunikun olam or sedek or justice we should be able to, we should be doing something about but really this is about us just as just as much as is about every other community because we touch all of these communities we exist in all of these communities there are jews in every single one of these communities there are jews who have parents in some of these communities there are jews that are married to some people in these communities and their and those families and their stories and their narratives matter as well it's interesting because I have two weddings in the pipeline that happen to be Jewish men marrying Asian women who are converting. So right off the bat there, they're going to be right Asian women in the Jewish community. Yes. Uh, Sarah, what would you say about why, what's the Jewish case for including these ethnicities in a curriculum? Well, I think first of all, just to go back to the previous quest, the previous comments, I think it's more than just, is it okay that we're taking this space? I think we have a responsibility as Jewish leaders to be speaking up on behalf of our communities, especially at a time when there's increased anti-Semitism. 
And with that in mind, I think that just as we have a responsibility to lift up our communities as we're facing increased bigotry and increased acts of hate, we have a responsibility to stand in partnership with other communities who are also experiencing increased acts of hatred towards them. I think about Charlottesville and that affected not just Jewish communities, but black communities and other communities of color. And we as a Jewish people, I think have a moral responsibility to protect ourselves and also to help other vulnerable communities to claim space, to share their stories and to be, um, to be protected. And part of being protected is, to, is by talking and by sharing your stories, passing down your narratives and making sure that everyone around you hears them. That is to me, the essence of ethnic studies. Dan? Look, it's, it's, a, it's a deep question, but I think it's important, you know, as a Jewish value, we learn, you know, if we expect others to, to help us, we, we should be helping other people. And I think this ethnic studies curriculum, ironically, through all the troubles is actually an example of that. Because if we're looking towards a, an end goal that we want to be quote unquote, good for us, then I think it's also our responsibility and we, and we want others to accept that. And just from a standpoint of, of community engagement and, and, and living in the same city and building a broad community, it's, it's important that we're aware and, and, and that we're also protecting the, the narratives of others. I, I do want to say, if I can take like two seconds to add, because I, I know it's, it's on the minds of folks, folks out there, you know, the current draft of the curriculum has mainly stuck to the four groups, these four narratives, they've broadened themselves a little bit and anything in those narratives is by our, by our reading and we work with a lot of curriculum experts is, is, is free of anything anti-Semitic and it is uh, treats the idea of ethnic studies fairly and, and moderately. It's not in any, um, it doesn't have too, any radical formalities of teaching ethnic studies and that there is an appendix that has narratives in it, lesson plans in it of other folks not in um, not in those main four chapters. And there are two lesson plans on Jewish Americans, a main lesson plan on Jewish Americans broadly, and a lesson plan specifically that uh, our friends at Jimena submitted on Jews from the Middle East and North Africa. And I think it's important to say that's where things stand because while things are good, any, you know, we're still monitoring how it gets taught um, and, we, and it's how it gets taught for us and, and for others. Um, and I think that as we move toward and we, 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 go, we go beyond this, you know, a lot of our work may in fact just be starting, um, but it's important to know where we came from and where things stand. Uh, and I really believe that, you know, our work was, was done appropriately, was done well, and now it's important to step and look at it from a collective standpoint on how this is taught. You know, one of the things to an earlier question, Rabbi Stern, and I'll wrap up, is that there's actually instruction in parts of the curriculum that tell a teacher, teach your classroom right? Who you see is who you should be teaching. And so that gives our, us, us good confidence that in our communities, lots of narratives and lots of stories about the Jewish people and Jewish Americans will be taught. We hope it's taught in other places as well, but we, at, at the very beginning, at least want our, um, our Jewish students to feel represented and in the teachers are instructed um, to do just that. But we also want to see that happening in classrooms throughout California, uh, you know, back to your last question here, because that's ultimately the, the holistic approach that makes this work as a statewide initiative. So Jesse, I teased you earlier about representing a predominantly Jewish district, but of course there are many others who aren't Jewish in your district, but yet you are the Jewish representative. So to what extent do you feel like it's important for you as a, a son, a child of the Jewish community, a son of the Jewish community, I should say, um, to represent others and to advocate for ethnic studies? Why is it a Jewish mission? And hit your mute. Whoops. There. I thought I thought I, I thought I'd get that one in 2021. I thought I was going to leave the mute button behind in 2020, but I, <laughs> I totally figured it out. Um, look, I'll I'll give you two reasons, uh, Rabbi. One is that it is deeply consistent with our with our values and our history to be fighting racism and bigotry. And this is something. Go back and read Abraham Joshua Heschel. I'm reading a great book right now by by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. This is work that is deeply consistent with Jewish tradition. This is things that go back to the prophet Jeremiah. And all of these, all of these, th this is work that we are called to do as Jews and, and that we are instructed to do as Jews and to lift up the vulnerable and to stand up for other communities. That is deeply consistent with the Judaism that, 
that that goes back and, and you can look at Rabbi Heschel, right? I mean, he doesn't, he, doesn't, he talks about this is important because this is consistent with the prophets of ancient Israel and the work that, and the work that we are called as Jews to do. And, you know, I, I think about, you know, what I, what I learned growing up and people in our community, you look back at those pictures of, of, of Rabbi Heschel or Rabbi Eisendrath marching with MLK, how proud are people of that? They see that as a beautiful expression of tikkun olam, as a beautiful expression of our Jewish values. And to the extent that ethnic studies is about fighting bigotry and discrimination and racism, this is very much Jewish work for us to be doing and a very pure expression of our Jewish values. Thank Another thing you. I'll say, which is, which is consistent with what Dan said, is that this is, this is good for us as a Jewish community, right? This is important to our relationships, to the security of our community. And I'll give you a tangible example here. For me, probably one of the most meaningful days in my service in the legislature was two days after the shooting at the, the Chabad in Poway. As you remember, that was a, a, a terrible day for us. Um, you know, it was a, 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 this, this deadly shooting at the Chabad. And two days later on a Monday, the legislature was in session. And it just so happened that it coincided with Yom HaShoah that we had actually brought Holocaust survivors, including many from the Valley up to the floor of the legislature to honor them and to teach our colleagues in the legislature about the Holocaust. And so we decided that we had to do something. And so we, we organized a press conference uh, where we called on the governor to put money in the budget for security for those who are at risk of, of hate motivated violence. And this is a, a bill that I'd authored, it had not been passed yet, it had not been funded. And we did a press conference calling on the governor to help stand up and put money in the budget to protect the Jewish community. And the leadership of every single one of those other caucuses came and stood with us. And that was for me one of the most powerful and meaningful moments of my service in the legislature to see the chair of the Black Caucus and the chair of the Latino Caucus and the API Caucus come and say, we stand with the Jewish community, we know that they are at risk, and we agree that we as a state need to stand up and protect our Jewish community. And that bill ultimately passed. Millions of dollars were put in the state budget, and actually Stephen Weiss got one of those security grants. So the security of your community was actually improved and impacted by the relationship building that we are doing. And so we know that both because it is deeply consistent with our values and our traditions, and also because it makes us safer. It is actually a meaningful thing to our community to be working in partnership with these communities. They stand up for us, we stand up for them, and we as a state are better for it. So I wanna thank you all for being here. And what I hope we've shared with those who are watching and have been listening, um, is the uh, ability to go deeply into the topic and see it from a more nuanced perspective um, by hearing from so many voices, the ones we've heard from today and the ones you'll hear from next week. Um, we hope to gain a, a much deeper understanding and also allow us to continue the work. We speak about tikkun olam as, as each of our presenters referenced. Um, the work of tikkun olam is not easy and it means getting our hands dirty, rolling up our sleeves engaging in ways perhaps that we never anticipated, but ultimately um, what we're trying to achieve is a world that's better for not just our, ourselves, but the next generations. And this ethnic studies curriculum that we've now succeeded in developing through our engagement, hopefully will affect the uh, educational experience of young children in California for several, for a couple of decades perhaps. Um, so it's a worthwhile effort. Um, so in addition to thanking the four of you and, and thanking you for your wisdom and your insights, I want to thank our sponsors, Adina and Bill Frank, who've helped to make this series po possible. Adina's input throughout as we prepared for this has been particularly meaningful. Uh, as always, I want to recognize and lift up the AJC Wise Partnership. It's a meaningful one that we hope will continue for many, many years. And for all of you who have joined us, I want to thank you for listening and opening your minds and your hearts to the conversation. I want to remind you again that the second session will be next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Same way, you will get a reminder notice. You need to register to get that notice. We'll be hearing from California Assembly Member Sidney Kamlager Dove, as well as LAUSD Board Member Nick Melvoin, also a, a product of the Jewish community of Los Angeles, and Anita Friedman, who has been intimately involved in the commission that has drafted the final version or the latest version of the curriculum, and uh, Rick Hershout from the American Jewish Committee will speak to the three of them and hopefully go deeply, I know, go deeply into the issues raised by, um, by, by the issues that they'll reveal some insights to. So thank you all for joining us. With that, we end our webinar and we again appreciate all who have participated. Have a good evening.